Could you, could you tell us a little bit more, Luz Maria, about what it was like um, being a young photographer growing up with the internal conflict um, in the late 80s and 1990s uh -huh. when you were just sort of starting out? Yes, well, I, I, I was uh, starting to, to in, be interested in, in photography around 1987, 1988, when I came out from school, from high school and uh, started to, to learn photography in this workshop, which, which was the only place to really study photography there at the time. There was no professional long-term education. And this was a, a, a time in, in Peru where we were actually living in, in, in a war, in, an, in a, what we call the internal conflict, but it was really a, an internal war between uh, a, the terrorist group uh, Sendero Luminoso and the state. Uh, so this had be begun actually in the 70s, but it, it really started to, to be noticed in the country because they were working very like under undercover before around the 80s. At the, the end of the 80s, the, the thing was really, really difficult, very, very violent all around. And so I, I decided to have this, this slide here to just to, to show people uh, by looking to the Peruvian map, how was the configuration of the, of the country at the time in terms of violence. Uh, we have the, the, the coast, all the yellow part is the, the coast uh, right next to the Pacific Ocean. We have the Andes, which are very, very big mountains, very difficult access. Uh, to traverse the, the, the Andes is very, very complicated. And then we have the jungle, no? all, the, all the right part. So Sendero Luminoso started in the central part of the Andes, actually in Ayacucho, and they were starting to spread, 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 first in the Andes making these uh, matanzas, these killings Massacres. of, uh, massacres of, of uh, campesinos, local people that wouldn't join them. They, what they wanted was to, to have all the local people join them and at the end they would want to, to get the power to destroy the government and to have the power. That's like what was this, their belief and, and in that they were just like recruiting people. Anybody who want to be with them, they would just kill them, kill their animals, burn their, their um, corpse. The corpse no? um, by the end of the, of the 80s, they were arriving like to Lima and also starting to make to put bomb car, bomb cars and and destroy tower electric towers in in the city so we would have like no light for days and we were living in this kind of uh, how to say uh, uh, curfew uh? curfew curfew when you can curfew, uh, curfew yeah. no uh, many years we were living in, uh, with curfew well i was an adolescent no so was the, um, well, it was very, very complicated to 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 be a young person there. I mean, to start your your own life at, at, in, in that conditions, um, like beginning to to try to create a, a life of yourself was was quite tough. And um, here are some photos that are uh, were taken at, at uh, by photojournalists at the time. Uh, this is one like classical image because it uh, shows the day where in 1980, very, very early, one morning some dogs, dead dogs appeared in different spots in the city, uh, hung by Sendero Luminoso with some signs uh, written on them, like um, announcing themselves as, as, uh, as a big presence in the, in the country. Um, then if we can keep going with the photos, um, just to show some, some of the things that were happening. Um, in, in Ayacucho, in the Andes, a normal common people will be uh, blockade because about, about terrorist attacks in the area, so every, everybody was suspected of being a terrorist also. So many people, innocent people, would be taken away or killed by the Ejército, no? So it was a crazy, absolutely crazy situation. 
Um, even even uh, young people, this is the uh, wake of Luis Ulca in Ayacucho. He was a student of sky, uh, high school. He might be maybe 14, 15 years old. And he was accused of treason and was murdered by Shining Path, Sendero Luminoso. So even the, the children was also being uh, convinced by Sendero to, to join them. Uh, this was also part of the of the normal like daily life um, they were finding graves that were being excavated and and so you would find the government would find that uh, some people was killed and and they were buried in some place in, in the andes and started the whole research to know who were they who had, who had killed them sometimes they never found out if if they were killed by sendero or by the or by the 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 state. Uh, this photo reveals how Sendero was already in the city, in the Lima, like the capital. This is a photo by Jaime Rasuri, uh, who has also photos in the in the exhibition now. Uh, this is the Universidad de San Marcos, a very important uh, public university in Lima, uh, and you can see it was a it was a, a, a classroom of of the humanities department. In 1989, I was at, at that time I was also a, a university student, but in another university, in the Catholic University, and you can see how uh, all the walls are written with notes by Sendero. So Sendero was operating inside the university. It, it at a time um, a group of um, soldiers were inside, also had a base inside the university, just to to to. Um, enfrentarse to confront. confront Sendero. So inside the university, which normally is like a place uh, out of, of of complications of this kind, was was the war actually inside the university. Um, sometimes there were like uh, these uh, strikes, armed strikes that were uh, called by Shining Path. So you would know that you could not traverse the country because they would be blocking the, the roads. And, and, and this image was interesting for me this time to, to bring to you because uh, my work, the one that is here in, in, in the exhibition called Punto Ciego, deals with all these travels uh, through the uh, Pan American Highway, which I started to do in 1996 uh, after uh, Sendero had slowed their, uh, their actions because uh, Sendero Luminoso leader Abimael Guzman had been captured in 1992. So for 1996, you could already be more free to, to go around. I mean, we did it even before, but you would, you would maybe find this kind of situation. No? So this is the Panamericana Norte blocked. Uh, so they would... Um, or, or keep people that were, were driving there, or just rob everything that they had in the car, or just put bombs in the, in, in, in the area. This also in the center of Lima, the um, commercial area in San Isidro, which is a very, like fin the financial center in the city, and they were putting um, car bombings there. N at the beginning uh, of their actions in the city center, there wouldn't be people killed. They will be uh, careful of putting the bombing cars uh, where no people was around, just like a signals, no? Like in front of a bank during the night or in, in the center of the financial district in the night where nobody would be killed. Later, they would do this in the very city center residential areas with lots of people, like this uh, in Tarata, Tarata is a street in the very center of Miraflores, a very residential area in the city. One weekday at 6, 7 p.m. at night, so like five buildings were completely destroyed, many people die. And, um, so this was in, in July 1992, this was like the top, the high point of the violence in the, in the country. And some, a few months later, in September of, of 1992, finally, uh, this guy, Abimael Guzman, was, was captured. At this time, of course, all the intelligentsias 
apparatus of the co of the country of the state was working to 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 capture them, but hadn't been uh, um, uh, exitosos successful successful. Sorry, and until until September where they got them. No? And I was a, stu a student at the Universidad de, de Católica. I was a student of linguistics and, lit and literature. I was also very interested in uh, photography at the time. There was no uh, place to study officially and formally at, uh, uh, photography at the time. There was no, as I, as I said, uh, um, higher education, only these little workshops, which I took, all, all of them, in Carlos Montenegro Center, which you I found, right? You were a founder of, yeah, the, was a founder of the Centro de Estudos e Investigación de la Fotografía. And um, while I, I was studying there at nights and I was going to classes in the Catholic University during the day, and at one point, like in my second and third semester, I, I decided I wanted to be an intern somewhere. I wanted to, to, to work. But I was thinking I was going to work as a um, writer or, or, or something related with literature or writing what I, that was what I was studying at the university and uh, in my second day in, at, at, at the work in a magazine where I started to, to work called Debate um, the editor, the graphic editor saw me arrive from my photo classes with my paper, with, uh, with my box of photo paper so he asked me if, if I was a photographer, and I said yes, <laughs> but I was only like I had only like made, gone to some a few classes in 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 Carlos Montenegro place, and that's how I started to work in press, which really was not of my profound interest. I I, I knew I, I didn't want to to put my life into into being a, a photojournalist at, at all. But for me, it was a very, very interesting, strong, um, I don't know, maybe it's because you are 17, 18, and you have this sensation that you have to leave everything now because life will end in two days. You know, that for me, uh, being work, working in the streets and working in, in this kind of, uh, of um, um, national very stressful situation was very very important. So I was working all everywhere I could, as a as a photo photo journalist. But photo you, you told me that that you d weren't out there in the midst of things, having to drive around and, and go to the strike site or the accident yeah. site, but that you proposed certain photo essays yeah. to them and found a different way to do photojournalism that in fact was more. Uh, more related to your actual artwork that you were yes doing. yes exactly yes that's people um when i was uh, told by this editor to make photographs i started doing very boring things like going to photographs persons during in interviews those were the, the very first things i did and then uh, the, the 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 editor of the magazine moved to a newspaper and he uh, invited me to join him and go to the newspaper, which was going to be much more inter interesting. And I said, okay, uh, I, I, I will be glad to, to go with you, but I don't want to do this crazy kind of uh, um, yeah, running thing and go and shoot and go back and, and, you know, and, and never be able to really think about what you are doing. Um, I, I couldn't handle that kind of, of Velocity of 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 uh, speed of speed and and but I was interested in, in, in analyzing things so I said I, I I would be glad to to do longer term projects which meant like three day projects I mean if there were weekly projects so I was working in the um, Saturday magazine of the newspaper and every week we would meet every Monday see what were the highlights of the week, and I would decide with, with him and with a partner, writer, partner, what I was doing. So I had like all the week to, to make this kind of photo essay uh, of very different issues. Um, this is, is a, a, 
a little story we did about a, a girl belonging to Ankare family that were living in a, in a cerro, in a, in a very, very poor uh, mountain that was in, invaded by local people. Uh, and she had, uh, she had run away from her family, and this was a story of how she was uh, caught by her father and, and brought her back to, to her home. I think that, yeah, these are the, the, um, the contact sheets. So sometimes there, there were very small things, like I, we were in, in the house of this family maybe 45 minutes and that was it. I, I had a chance to do these photos. When I found that some of the photos were interesting for me, I decided to, I decided to develop them myself, which was much more work for me, but that was the only way to, to take care of the material. So I would develop, uh, print the, 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 the photos and take them to the newspaper. The, the previous, uh, photos. The previous uh, images are from another uh, commission in El Carmen, uh, in Ica, south of Lima, a place where where Afro-Peruvian people live. And this was for another magazine, for the L'Imaginaire magazine, uh, which was being published by the um, Alianza Francesa. In, in, in Lima, although I was only o also working. So Punta Ciego is probably your earliest piece, and w would you mind just sort of talking briefly about the process and how maybe it's connected to that earlier photojournalist experience and the context that you've already described? Yeah, I, I was. This is uh, my 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 earliest like long term work because I had been doing my own in parallel to my press work. What I was really interested in was in my like my own private uh, in research with photography. So also since uh, the the end of the 80s and earliest of the 90s, I was doing uh, photos and even exhibitions. Some some group exhibitions. I even had a, a very small personal exhibition in 1991. And I was like trying to find my way in what I was really interested in photography as art. Um, as I said, I really had not um, profound education in photography in a, in a theoretical way. I, was, I had learned more like, more like uh, technical things. And there was not internet at the time, so we were we were we had very very little information. We would uh, share two or three books that came to Lima, and we were like eating them and passing by them to other person. And so, the, so the, our education was was really um, yeah, so, I mean small. Later, of course, I, I was traveling. I, I came. I went to Europe in 1992, and for me, that was a very intense education situation. Not not because I was studying in any place, but because I was visiting every museum or every gallery. And in 1996, I started. I, I bought in 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 actually by recommendation of Billy Herr, also Paulo's father, a very little uh, camera. Uh, a Nikon camera, a pocket camera, absolutely basic camera, um, that cost $100 and had very nice quality, even though it was like a almost quite, uh, plastic lens and very simple, a uh, 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 point and shoot camera. Uh, and I bought this in, in 1995 in a, in a trip I, I did to San Francisco, California. And I came back to Lima and to Peru and in next, if the following year, I started to do this trip to uh, in the Panamericana with, with my car to the north coast of the country, and I started to do this these photographs through the window of my of my car. And after the first trip, I came back and I understood that something was appearing there that I was interested in. The camera had this false panoramic situation that you had a button and you could cut the negative in the top and in the bottom. So your negative, your 35 millimeter negative was actually like a third of a 35 millimeter negative, very, very tiny negative. So this began like with no intention as a project and very soon just going and photographing and looking to the, to the contact sheets 
I began to 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 find like clues of the logic of the work. Um, one of them was uh, taking photos uh, mainly in the desert areas. Peru, as I showed you in the in the in the map, this has this long coast, which is um, a combination of desert areas with small valleys that are formed by the rivers that come from the Andes. But when they come all the way from the Andes, the rivers to the coast to the Pacific Ocean, they have almost very little water. So the valleys are very small valleys, and the rest is desert. So I, I wanted to, to focus on the desert areas. Um, and I began to find this, this kind of, I don't know, kind of language that, where I, I wanted to, to have an experience of distance, and an experience of, of flatness. I was not interested at all in this um, mo more modernist kind of landscape photography that I have seen before, uh, with which I was actually educated in, in my in my in my um, workshops. I wanted much a, a much more dry experience. I wanted to get away to get rid all you know in all possible forms of a more like kind of folkloric uh, image of the country that had been very intense before. No llamas, no Andes, no, yeah. no Machu Picchu. No, no, no. I wanted to get rid of this image that for me was the, the most easy way to sell the country, you know, because you are like selling yourself with the image you project of, your, of yourself, no? So, of course, um, plumas and Indians and llamas and all that, and, 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 and like some iconic uh, images of the country was like the, the, the way that we were being um, easily seen and understood. Despite and all of the violence and the, yeah. and the, the troubled years, you were still being folklorized. Yeah, e exactly. And, and I wanted to, to give attention to the almost invisible things in the coast. The blind spot. The blind spot. That's what I, call, I, what I called after. The, the, the title came, came at the end. When I, when I was almost finishing the, the, the work. And I found this, I don't know, I, I can't remember how I, have, how I found the blind spot concept because I didn't know it before, but is this, uh, is this point of the, of the eye where lots of, of nervous terminals uh, coincide and, and that, that the eye actually cannot see in that part of the eye. So it is the, the brain that completes the images in, in your mind. Uh, so for, for me, uh, giving attention to this, if we can go to the next, yeah. To giving attention to, to, to these uh, very small things in the, in, the, in, the, in the landscape was like uh, signaling these blind spots in our coast. Uh, also, I, w I wanted to be a way of any kind of um, um, very emotional things, or like, or, or I, I didn't want to, to 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 try to find this kind of mirror thing that we have learned bef in the in the photo in the landscape photography before, no? The the, the the modernist aspect of this kind of the landscape is it, a mirror of, of, of my inner inner world. So I, I wanted not to be uh, projecting myself in, in the images, but to look what was there, just there. So that's why I decided to put the kilometer, the number of the kilometer in every photo in the, in the lower mar margin. It was the number of the kilometer where I did, did the, the, the picture as a way to just signaling, signaling? Signal. Signal. Um, that this, anything, has a presence, this almost invisible, this almost nothingness some, sometimes had a, an actual uh, place in the, in the, in the coast. No? And also I, I wanted to, to not give a hierarchy. A hierarchy. Yeah, hierarchy among the, 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 the things. So for, I wanted to, to have a tree or a person or a stone or a house or whatever 
in the same level of importance. Also, I, I didn't want to psychologize, psychologizar portraits, but to have them as part of the, of the scene. And so the entire series, you did, after doing all the revision of all your trips and all, all of the contact sheets, you, you ended up with 70. Yeah, I ended up with, with 70 images. We have 15 in the gallery. Wish yeah. we could have all 70. Yeah, we have 15. This uh, this is an ex uh, my my retrospective uh, two years ago, and we managed to put like 50. So this is not a complete series either. This is only 50 because one of my uh, requisites for installation is that the whole work goes in a single line. So the 70 <laughs> needs needs a lot a lot of, of space. Yeah, to have them together. Thank you, Liz Marie. I'm going to switch to Pablo now.